Good morning, good morning. All of our kiddos coming down to get a goodie bag. Our last Sunday of every month, we have our children join us in second service so that they can uh, watch their parents worship. It's a good Sunday to have your uh, kids with you and see the parents worship this morning, right? That was good this morning. That was good stuff. Um, We had a crazy week here this week. Um, On Thursday night, we had our, um, our Recovery Alive, that is our recovery ministry for those that are struggling with things in their life, which is all of us, but um, we have a ministry that meets on Thursday nights. It used to be Celebrate Recovery, it's now, we call it Alive at Living Water. Um, and this past Thursday night, um, our friends with Broken Chains, which is uh, a motorcycle gang, they're a motorcycle club of guys and ladies who love Jesus, but they had their rally up in Maggie Valley this week, and uh, so Thursday night, they rode in with 60, 70, 80 motorcycles. We had 150 or so people here Thursday night, and my new friend John Eklund from Temple City Church up around Raleigh uh, spoke for us on Thursday night, and man, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit just woof, came through, and uh, I was shook. Y'all know what it is to be shook? Yeah, I mean, all of y'all have shaken a kid before, right? But you know what it is to be shook, right? I was shook. And then last night, our women's ministry that we've been talking about for months and months, they hosted Miss Hosanna Wong that was here last night. And uh, there were uh, well over 200 ladies and men that were here serving. Thank you to all of y'all that were here last night. And I'm telling you, she just absolutely brought the house down last night, speaking the Word of God. Um, when she came off stage, I met her back in the back room, and I said, Hosanna, I really want to tell you I'm mad at you. And she looked at me, and she said, oh, pastor, I'm sorry, did I do something wrong? I said, yeah, I got to follow you and preach tomorrow morning. This ain't good. <laughs> so she did amazing. It's just been, for me personally, it's been a week where I have just seen the Holy Spirit move. And you may be new to church, and the word Holy Spirit, you're thinking, well, it's not even Halloween yet. Why are we talking about spirits? Listen, the Holy Spirit's real. Um, He is God in the spirit that lives inside of us and works in our lives. So he has been real this week. If you've experienced any of that this week, would you say amen? Amen. All right, if you haven't, sorry, but it was really, really good, all right? So we're starting a new series this morning. It's entitled Letters uh, to Leaders. And I want to help you understand as we walk through this series a little bit about the Bible, a little bit about the, uh, the writers of the Bible and how this was sort of put together. So if you're new to the Bible, or maybe you've been around the Bible for a long time, and you're not aware, you're just kind of gathering information that you already know. Our Bibles uh, that we have, that we carry, are basically divided into two sections. You have the Old Testament, which the Old Testament is Hebrew Scripture. It was written for the Jews, for the Hebrew nation, but it also brings about um, the Messiah. So we don't disregard the Old Testament, but we know where it is in history and prophets and commands and things that were there. So we have the Old Testament that is there that we learn from and we apply and we use. And then we have the New Testament. The New Testament tells us about the life of Jesus. The first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are the Gospels written by eyewitnesses. You need eyewitness testimony when you want to believe things. Eyewitnesses saw Jesus' life, saw his death, and saw his resurrection. And the first four books of the New Testament give us testimony to that. Then as the New Testament begins to roll, the very next book is called the book of Acts. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. It's the early church, the way the early church got started. It tells the stories of Peter and John, of James being martyred, of Stephen being martyred. It tells the stories of how the church began. And about halfway through the book of Acts, we're introduced to a character by the name of Saul. Now, you need to understand something about early church history. So coming out of a Jewish background, the Jewish leaders, some of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, these were different people in leadership and, and ruling in, uh, in the early church or in the, in the Jewish history, um, they were opposed to this new movement. Because see, you got to understand, when Jesus walked around on the earth, he said things like, if you were here last Sunday, he said things like, I'm the bread of life. Moses gave you manna from heaven, but I am the bread of life that if you will eat me, you will never die. And when Jesus would teach those kinds of things, they would go, uh, eat your flesh and drink your blood. That's some weird stuff. But Jesus would teach, but Jesus was the fulfillment of 
of the commands of the Old Testament in the flesh. So this new idea, it wasn't really called Christianity. It was called the way. It was for the Jewish leaders and for people that had followed all of these Jewish laws, this was kind of a cult. It was kind of, I can't believe you're spitting at all the things that we've been taught and everything that's been done. Well, then we're introduced to this guy named Saul. Saul is, uh, he's a follower of the Jewish tradition. He has learned, he has studied under the very best Jewish teachers. He knows his stuff, and he's getting more and more angry with this group called the Way. So Saul goes to the leaders in Jerusalem, in the headquarters, and he says, we need to stop this movement. See, here's the problem, though. Jesus died. He said he was going to die. And then he said, three days later, I'm going to raise from the dead. So guess what? You can't stop a movement when somebody comes back from the dead and says they're God. But those early Jewish leaders with Saul said, we're going to stop it. So Saul went around. He got letters and he went to the the other countries, to different cities, and he said, we're going to persecute these people. We're going to throw them in jail. We're going to have them killed. Saul was actually present. At the very first martyr, the very first murder, Stephen, a deacon who was stoned to death, Saul was there. And one particular day, Saul was on a road to a city called Damascus. And while he was walking with his satchel in his hand and all of the letters to arrest Christians, he was going to go to this next temple or or next tabernacle and tell them, I've got letters, we need to arrest these people. While he was on this road with his entourage, his posse that was traveling with him, Saul and the merry men, as they were traveling along, God God opened up heaven, and a light from heaven shone down on Saul. And Jesus stepped forward out of heaven and spoke and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul looked up to heaven and went, huh? That's that's the Greek translation into English, all right? Um, and, And Jesus said, you're persecuting me. And Saul got introduced to a living, risen Jesus. And at that moment, Jesus said, you will no longer persecute me, but you will eventually be persecuted and you will point people to me. It was at that very moment that God changed Saul's name to Paul. And Paul, from there, began to plant churches all over the modern world at the time. He, he, matter of fact, the New Testament, the Bible that we hold from about Acts, about the book of Romans, all the way to almost Hebrews, every single letter in there is written by the Apostle Paul. So most of the New Testament that you're reading was written by him, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's writing letters to churches. He's talking to different groups of people. He's giving rebuke. He's giving correction. He's giving encouragement. And right in the middle of those letters are three little tiny letters. Actually, two of the letters are written to one young man, and another one of the letters is written to another young man. They're both pastors in very difficult situations, very difficult cities. The three books or letters that Paul wrote, um, the first one is 1 Timothy. What do you think the se- name of the second one is? 2 Timothy. That was pretty good, all right? 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. And then he wrote another little short letter to a pastor by the name of Titus, which the book carries his name. It's out of those three books that we are going to take this series over the next four to five weeks to let you know that there are letters written to leaders. Now, I need to, I need to set something forward this morning. You are a leader. Matter of fact, I need you to do something for me. Say, I am a leader. Do it. I am a leader. Now, some of you went, uh-uh, I ain't a leader. I remember when I went to school and the teacher would go, we're going to follow the leader today. And you would go, nope, I ain't having nothing to do with that. I'm not a leader. I'm not going to do it. Some, when people today say, hey, we need you to lead something, you like fake a stroke and you are not going to be part of it at all. You don't want anything to do with leadership. But here's the problem. If you are a Christian, matter of fact, let me give you a statement, and I'm going to use some notes this morning, and you're going to follow along on the screen or the QR code and get on there. Here's the statement. You ready? All Christians, and if you're, if you're not a Christian this morning, you're like, oh, shoot, I'm off the hook. Well, actually, you're kind of not. But uh, all Christians are called to be leaders in some area of life. Every single one of us. Every Christian that's sitting here this morning, you are called to be a leader. You can sit there and you can say, but I don't want to be a leader. Well, there's a problem with that. See, I studied the Greek language this week. 
I spent deep amounts of time in the original language and I pulled up my lexicons and my, all my stuff and I was like, I got to help people understand who say, I don't want to be a late leader. And I found the Greek word. For those of you that say, I don't want to be a leader. You want to hear the Greek word? It's this one. <laughs> I made that up, all right? I ain't going to believe nothing else I'm saying, I'm sure. Too bad. Too bad. L- let me see if I can kind of take the beginning of this before I get into the book of Titus. I'm going to be in Titus 2 here in just a little bit. But I want to help you understand that every single one of us is a leader. Matter of fact, let me, let me take another little letter that Paul wrote. Um, it's, it's called 2 Corinthians. It's actually the third letter he wrote to the church at Corinth. But there's one of them that was never found. So we have 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. But this is the letter. And let me help you out. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, all Christians are created to be leaders. Look at this. Paul is writing this letter to the church at Corinth. And he says this. He says, for Christ's love compels us. You want to know why, if you're a Christian, you're called to be a leader? Because of his love. Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore, all died. That means because Jesus died for us, we all die to our own desires and our own wants, and we give ourselves to Jesus. He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and raised again. See, here's the problem. So many people today want to make themselves happy. They want to say, life is all about me getting what I want, doing what I want to do, and as long as I'm happy, everything must be good. Well, that is not what God called those of us that call ourselves Christians. It's not what he called us to do. He said, we are supposed to give our lives serving others. Paul continues to write. He says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, no one in trying to live for themselves, though some of you regarded Christ this way. Some of you thought Christ was that way. We do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. In other words, if you become a Christian, if you're someone that's following Jesus, you are a new person. If you're a new person, the old is gone and the new is here. All this, verse 18, all this is from God. And here's where it gets interesting. You ready? All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Now let me help you understand what the word reconciliation is. Uh, This is your illustration this morning. For those of you that are under, my guess is around 20, 25, you're going to have to have a little bit of explanation to help you out. For those of us that might be older than that or a little bit older, older in that age, here's the thing. How many of you, this is going to be crazy for those of you that are younger, we used to, this is crazy, we used to balance our checkbooks. Y'all remember that? How many of y'all remember balancing your checkbook? Y'all remember doing that? It was crazy. Wait a minute. Hang on a second. We used to write checks. All right. That'll help you out just a little bit. All right. Well, what we would do, and I was horrible at it. I was terrible about putting receipts in the checkbook. So that was my monthly fight with my wife because she was fantastic at balancing the checkbook. Balancing the checkbook means that you take this side, the money you spent, and you balance it with this side, the amount of money that the bank says you actually have. And your goal is to get those to, you ready for the word? Reconcile. To reconcile. So the idea when Paul says that God reconciled us to himself through Christ, what he's saying is this. You and I, we are born into sin. We are born sinners. If you have a baby in your house, that is a blessed little sinner in your house. As they become two, you begin to realize they really are little sinners. And you remove the blessed part of it. And then from 2 to about 13, you're trying to adjust their sinfulness in their lives. And then according to Mark Twain, at 13, you put them in a barrel and you cut the hole in it so they can breathe. And then at 18, you plug up the hole. Well, anyway, that's all right. You don't, don't do that. We're all sinners. We're born into sin. Because we are born into sin, there is no possible way for us to be reconciled to God. You see, God demands perfection. God demands absolute perfection. The only way for you and I to have eternal life in heaven is for you and I to be perfect. Absolutely 100% perfect, having never committed a sin, having never done anything wrong, having never said a bad word on I-26 when you're trying to get somewhere. No sin whatsoever. That is the only way to God. Therefore, everyone in this room is burnt toast at this point 
right? Well, this is this beautiful word called reconcile. Because what happens is we owe this astronomical debt because we can't be perfect. And every sin we commit separates us further and further and further from God. But God sent Jesus. So what Jesus did is he came down to this earth, lived a perfect life as the sinless son of God, and reconciled our bank account. Therefore, you can go to heaven, you can be a follower of Jesus, and you can, not because of anything you earned, not because of any of your work, but because God sent Jesus to reconcile the account. Isn't that cool? You like that? All right, that's what God did. Now, you want to know why you're a leader? Look at the next statement. Because... Wait a minute, go back to that. I wasn't done yet. Go back to the other. There you go. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. Y'all are amazing. I appreciate you, all right? And after he reconciled us to Christ, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That means that this reconciling that God gave to us through Christ, it is now our responsibility to lead others. Because Jesus died, rose. He's with the, uh, sitting on the right hand of the Father in heaven right now. So he leaves us here to do this ministry of reconciliation. It's our job to lead others others. Verse 19, that God was reconciled the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Aren't you glad he doesn't count our sins against us? It would be really rough if he did. He doesn't. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So it's our job to continue this and to lead others. Verse 20. Now you can go to the next one. I'm sorry, Becca. All right. Verse 20. All right. We are therefore Christ ambassadors. Ambassador is somebody who represents in another country their home country. So an ambassador is sent from the United States and lives in another country as a representative of the country that they are a part of. Well, I love that Paul says we are ambassadors of Christ. I don't know if you know this or not, but the earth is not our home if we are Christians. We are only here for a little amount of time. I don't know how long you're going to get. I don't know how many days you've got. I don't know how many minutes you've got. I don't know if any of y'all are going to fall out right now in church and be done. And we're going to switch from church service to funeral. We're not. But if that happened, you don't know. We don't know when we're going to die. We don't know when that's going to happen. My ultimate goal, the reason I'm trying to get more and more healthy, is I want to live to be 122 years old. That is my goal, because if I can make it to 122, that will have meant that I have been married to Missy for 100 years, and that is a pretty good flipping goal. That's what I'm shooting for. Um, She may kill me before then, but that's what we're shooting for, all right? So let me get you to understand this. We're not of this world, so therefore, we are representing Christ to this world. He says this, as though God were making his appeal through us. That's leadership. That's what God calls every single one of you to do. I don't want to be a leader. Remember the Greek translation. Too bad, you are. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's your first step. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's a wonderful theological statement called impartation. It's actually double impartation. So what it means is this. It means that God took all of the wrath that belongs on us. Listen, I hadn't even gotten into the message yet. This is just introduction, all right? God took all of the wrath because we can't be reconciled to God. Y'all got that, right? Y'all understand that? So God took all of the wrath that's supposed to be poured out on us, hell, eternity, separated from him, and he poured it on his son. He imparted that wrath on his son. That's part of the imputation. The other thing that he did is he took the sonship of God. This is so cool. I know y'all aren't geeking on this, but I am. He took the sonship of God and he placed that on us. You know what that means? I am now called a child of God. Yeah, try to mess with me. My daddy will whoop you up. Yeah? So, I'm not a leader. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. So what do we do with this? This is where I'm going to get into the little book of Titus this morning. And I'm going to spend a few minutes there, and then we're going to be done, all right? See, the thing is this. The question isn't this. The question isn't, are you a leader? The question is, where are you leading? Where, where are you leading? Because if you want a really good example of what leadership is, Paul says it this way in his teaching to Titus. He says, when generations give back by helping the next generation. By the way, that's us, grandparents. That's us, Uh, parents. That's all of us. It is our responsibility to teach 
our next generation, the next people. Our children are in our service on Sunday mornings. And when you come in here with your kids on the last Sunday of the month, and you're like, doggone it, I was going to drop the kids off this morning. Part of the reason that we do this is so they can sit in here with you. And you may be going, well, I can't even pay attention. Well, why don't we make it about them and you be here with them and you point them to Jesus. And when we sing a song that says, just say the name of Jesus, you ought to be saying it louder than anybody else. I mean, scare your kids to death. Do it. Just look at him and go, Jesus is the only one. That's how you do it. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. You're good, all right? Let your mama do that. It'll be good. So here's where Paul goes. I'm a little excited if you can't tell, all right? Paul's teaching Titus, and he says this. Titus chapter 2, verse 2. This is where I'll spend the rest of the time, and then I'm going to let you go, all right? Again, Paul giving this. He says, if you want to teach, if you want to show what a leader's supposed to do, I'm going to give you the illustrations. Here they are. You ready? Oh, by the way, I just want to let you know. I'm just going ahead and giving this statement. This is Paul teaching, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So when you get your feelings hurt here in just a couple of minutes, you're not going to dislike me because I'm just telling you what Jesus said, okay? And good luck being mad at him, okay? All right, so we're going to dig in. Here's what Paul says to Titus in Titus chapter 2. Teach the older men to be temperate. Well, again, let me give you a little bit of an understanding of Scripture. When you stand and you teach and when you tell others about it, when you're studying the Bible, you need to understand what the original audience was hearing. So the original audience, when Paul was teaching this to Titus, they were hearing how to set up a church, how to do family, how the generations are supposed to go. Remember, this is first century world, a whole lot of different climate and and socioeconomic life than what we live in today. So Paul's writing to them, well, when you're teaching or when you're studying the Bible, you have to get the original meaning, understand who the original audience was, and then you have to do something called bridging the context, which means you have to take it from there and say, how does this bridge so that it'll apply to my life or to your life? So here we go. Teach the older men to be temperate. Some of y'all are going, well, I'm not old yet. I mean, I'm looking on the stage and that's old and I'm not there yet. So some of you are going, I'm not old yet. Well, let let me help you out here. Um, Does anybody in this room have somebody that you're older than? You're older than somebody, aren't you, buddy? Every single one of us is older than somebody, unless somebody walked in and birth. <laughs> all right, anyway, you're fine, all right? You're older. So Paul gets you to understand this, and he's speaking to men here, and he says, older men, teach the older men to be temperate. Temperate means that you have control of your anger, have control of your emotions. Anger and saying I have a temper, listen, I have heard too many times in my life, well, that's just me, I just have a temper. My grandpa had a temper, my daddy had a temper, and I have a temper. Well, no. You are responsible for you. Now, I, I get it. I raise kids. My kids are older now. And, and I went through those times when my son would drive me absolutely crazy. And, and this is what was crazy. is I'd get so angry at him. And it seemed like every time that I got just ferociously mad at him, there would be a mirror nearby. And I would catch my reflection in the mirror and go, ooh, that's my dad. How did that work out? And I started calling them my daddy faces. My daddy faces are like when my my nostrils would flare and my forehead would turn beet red. Now, my dad went bald, so I tried to hold back on that just a little bit. But um, I get it. Sometimes temperament are like, well, I'm just fault. No, 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 no. You can control that. Did you know that anger is a secondary emotion? Did you know that you don't have to get angry? You don't have to. Matter of fact, when you begin to mature... When you begin to understand who you are, both emotionally and spiritually and physically, you begin to recognize when it wells up inside of you. You know what it is to begin to feel angry. But when you start maturing as a human being, and especially as somebody that's following Jesus, you begin to recognize that anger, and you ask yourself the question, what is it that's making me angry? Anger is secondary. What is it that's taking me there? And then you deal with that particular issue. So Paul's teaching this, teach the older men to be temperate. Worthy of respect. Respect is not something that's just given. Respect is to be earned, and we understand that. Paul says be self-controlled. Some of these words I don't have to give a lot of explanation to. Paul says uh, men should be self-controlled. They should be sound in faith. That means that they should be digging. That means that if you are a guy that is sitting here this morning talking exclusively to men right now, you should be digging into God's word. And you may be saying, well, I'm, I'm a new Christian. Good. Don't stay a new Christian. 
It's said other times in Scripture that adults don't drink milk at every single meal. It's time to go to meat. If you're still sucking on the nipple of a bottle when you're reading the Bible every single time you open the Bible, you're not maturing. It's time to get some meat in there. Grow in your faith. And then he says, not only do I want you to be sound in faith, I want you to be sound in love. Ooh, you know what that means, guys? That means we've got to get in touch with our emotions. Isn't that horrible? Uh, I'm a dude, man. I don't do emotions. I just shoot them deers. They stack them up, man. I don't get I know emotions. What's I know? I know that's Bambi's mama. But I'm gonna shoot her, and we're gonna go on. All right? No, in love means that you begin to deal. You begin to walk in this. You begin to show that. You begin to love others in that way. And then he says, "Be sound in your endurance." That means continue to grow. Be consistent. Don't be somebody that jumps to the next whim and the next idea and the next everything else. Be consistent in your faith. Now that section of scripture, that section of teaching was easy as could be for me because I'm a dude. And I can tell dudes what other dudes need to do. I don't have a problem with that at all. Men, you need to stand up and be a man of God and be who you're supposed to be. Men, that's what you're supposed to do, right? Now comes the section where he talks to women. (laughs) And I've never been one of them, so uh, this is hard. All right? Now, I am half woman on my mom's side of the family. But (laughs) it makes its way. It's all good. You'll get it in a little. You'll be on your way home going, oh, I get that now. All right, anyway, all right? So Paul begins to teach to the women now. And look at these words. And I love that Paul uses words like likewise. In other words, he's saying everything that I just taught to the men, I want you to understand this, but I also want you to understand that as a, as a woman, as a lady, as you're a leader as well. Now, he's going to step on toes. So ladies, remember, this is Jesus, not Tony, but here it comes. Let it eat. If the shoe fits, put it on and make your toes hurt, all right? Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live. That doesn't mean that you walk around going, oh, everywhere you go. It just means be reverent. Be, be, represent Christ everywhere you go. Now's where it gets interesting. He says, teach these women to not be slanderers. Everybody say slanderer for me. Okay, I need to help you out. Mm. So the word slanderer. The word slanderer, we would probably translate that more in today's world as being a gossip. Now, I'm sure there are no women in our church that gossip, Right? None of y'all. We pray together, ladies. Isn't that right? I mean, we specifically talk about other people while we're praying, but we pray together, right? Okay, let me, let me I, I wanted to be funny, but I want to be very, very serious. So the word slander, if, if, if you break that word down and you go back to the original meaning of where it came from, the word slanderer, you know where it comes from? It comes from the word Satan. If you are a gossip, listen to me, ladies. And by the way, some of you are going, well, I don't gossip to anybody. I just listen to it. You're a gossip. So the literal translation of don't be slanderers is this. Don't do the devil's work. Don't listen to it and don't say it. Now, some of you ladies are sitting there going, I've, been, I've seen men. I mean, you get men around at Hardee's on a Tuesday morning. There's some gossip going on at that heart. You're right. You're right. I'm with you. I've, I've been to a men's prayer breakfast at church. I get it. There's a whole lot of talking, a little bit of praying, a whole lot of gravy. I understand completely. That's the way it works. But this is what Paul addressed. Paul said to the women, I want you to understand, do not be slanderers. Don't be that. Don't be the people that speak gossip or talk to gossip. And I've heard this over the years. I've heard women who will say, you know, gossip will just tear people down, and I'm not going to repeat it. But if somebody needs to talk to me, they can. You know what you do? There is an incredible thing with all these little computers we carry in our pockets. If somebody's calling you to gossip, ladies, here's what you do. You scroll down to their number and you hit block. And you do not answer any more phone calls or texts from people that want to slander. Because anytime somebody wants to slander, they are doing the work of the devil. Just in case you're wondering. That was easier than I thought it was going to be. Okay, cool. All right? So, don't slander. And then he goes on, and Paul says, make sure that as women, that you're not addicted to much wine. By the way, when it says much wine, that doesn't give you the opportunity to go, well, it ain't much. I just drink a little. It's fine, all right? I mean, when I'm making Marcella chicken, it's just a little wine and a mar- and a little wine. And that's not what he's saying, all right? What he's saying is this. He's saying, don't be addicted. Don't continue to make your life about getting the next thing, the next thing. And by the way, we can, we can pick on those that go too far with alcohol, but we can also pick on people who go too far with 
I don't know, social media, entertainment, alcohol, romance novels. I'm just picking on women now, so we'll just move on, all right? So instead he says this, ladies, I want you to teach what is good. And then he says, then they can urge the younger women. So remember, we're generationally leader to leader to leader to leader. Then, so if you're living this way, and okay, if you're an older lady, yeah, Paul's specifically speaking to you, but he's also speaking to younger women as well, because you younger ladies, when you learn this, you begin to act and begin to live this way as well. He says, then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and their children. Now, now listen, I get this. I've served in church the majority of my life. I've been the guy who hands out the folders in Sunday school classes on Sunday mornings. I can remember times of walking past the ladies' Sunday school classes, not at this church. I would never use an illustration of bad at this church. It was always the other churches. Anyway, all right? So I can remember going by, and all the ladies were just, and as I walked up and they saw it was me, they all stopped talking. <laughs> now that's one of two things that's one of two things either they're doing something wrong or they're talking about me so either way I did the responsible thing as a pastor I left the room stood at the door and continued to eavesdrop and to listen to what they were saying here's what I picked up on what they would do is they would sit and they would gripe about the younger women in the church I can't believe she wore those shorts to church on a Sunday morning I can't believe she wears her hair like that. Oh, my goodness. Does she not understand? And I wanted so desperately. I was young. I, I couldn't do this kind of stuff. I'd get beat up by old ladies, and I was not going to do this. I wanted so desperately to walk in and go, teach them. Y'all have a good day. See you now. All right. See, Paul says this. It's our responsibility to carry this on. Ladies, it's your responsibility to carry this on. And he says, urge the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled and to be pure, to be busy at home. Now listen, remember I said before, we get original context and then we have to bridge the context into today's world. In the first century, most women, they, they, they were at home. They raised children, they were at home, they took care of the house, they took care of the, uh, the farm or wherever it was they were living, whatever they were doing for agriculture or whatever it was, they took care of that but we understand in today's world um, a lot of women they work outside of the house it's great if you can stay home and that works out and you can financially do it I don't understand how you live in Henderson County and can do that but if you can God bless you that is awesome but what it means if I can bridge this context is make sure that home is your priority See, my wife and I have moved several times in our marriage and every single time we've moved I buy a house we buy a house but you know what happens after I buy a house my wife turns it into a home. And that's what Paul is saying, that uh, it's my house, it's my wife's home, and she turns it into a home. And, and Paul's teaching, he's saying, ladies, I want you to make your house a home. I want you to make it something where God is reverence, where your children are brought up. And then he says to be self-controlled, to be pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to their husbands. And, and I, I want you to catch this. Does, it doesn't mean that, ladies, you have to wake up every morning if you're married and get out of bed and, and stand next to the bed. And when your husband wakes up, that you look at him and you go, sweetheart, what would you like for me to do for you today? Because I am your humble servant. I'm here for you. <laughs> no, that's not what that means. Uh, can I tell you why I'm the leader in my home? Do you, you know why I'm the leader of, I am, I lead my home. You want me to tell you why I'm the leader of my home? Because my wife lets me lead. That's why. She does. My, my wife understands. See, I, I didn't set this. Paul didn't set this. God set this in the Garden of Eden. He created man before he created woman. He created a structure that is set in place. He created this. And I need guys to understand. Even though Paul's writing the ladies right now, I need men to understand this. If you are a husband, if you have a wife or, or children or it's just you and your wife, it doesn't matter. If you are a husband and you have a wife that is there with you, yes, God created you and God created her. And, and you weren't, I, I do this in weddings all the time, God didn't create the woman out of man's head so that she could rule over him. God didn't create a woman out of a man's feet so that he could step on top of her. God created a woman out of a man's side so that he could love her and cherish her and treat her as an equal. And that is our responsibility as husbands and as men. You want to know when Paul says in Ephesians, he says, husbands love your wives the way Christ loved the church. Y'all know what Jesus did for the church, don't you? He died for the church. Now, there's a lot of men that'll sit out here and go, well, I'm willing to take a bullet for my wife, man. I'd die for. Christ wasn't willing to die. Christ died. 
How does that relate into today's world? As a husband and as a man, it is our responsibility to die to our selfish desires. It is our responsibility to say, it is no longer I that I am living for. God has given me someone to care for, to love, to protect, to consider an equal, to build her up in Christ. And one day, husbands, when you stand before God, God's going to look you square in the eyes and he's going to say, did you lead your home and did you lead your wife? Men, we are going to be responsible before God about our wife's spirituality and walk with God. And if you don't like that, men, the same Greek word I've used several times applies to you in that moment, all right? Now back to the ladies. See, I can yell at men. I just love ladies, all right? So that sounded creepy. But anyway, all right, Um, back to the ladies. It says, be subject to your husband. That doesn't mean bow at his feet. That means love him. Treat him the way that God wants him to be treated. That verse in Ephesians, it says, husbands, love your wives the way Christ loved the church. It then says, as an illustration, women submit or respect your husband. Now, a lot of women struggle with that, and they're like, I don't want to submit. Well, let me, let me see if I can help you understand something, ladies. If you have a husband that is treating you the way that God created you to be as a daughter of the king and holds you in respect and loves you and has a desire to meet every need he can humanly meet of you in this life, It's pretty easy to respect and submit to that man. So, Paul says this. So, that no one will malign the word of God. So, Paul says when you're not living this way, when this is not the way you are, you're not being a leader and you're not living out the word of God. All right, I'm going to hurry. All right, let's move down to verse 6. Again, he uses words like likewise and similar. Right here he says similarly. He goes back to the men. Encourage the young men to be self-controlled. That means control your emotions and everything. Set them as an example by doing what is good in your teaching. Show integrity. Tell the truth when you talk. In seriousness, that doesn't mean that you got to walk around somber, somber and never tell a middle school joke. What it means is that you look at life as something that's serious. In soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. Make sure that people know you're a Christian by the way you talk, by the way you live, by the way that you walk. So that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. In other words, when you uh, go to work, when you're leading your family, don't put on your Christian t-shirt in the morning and then cuss out your kids before you take them to school. Because what you're doing is saying this whole God thing is a joke. And it's not. So, let, let, let me just get sticky in some, this is really sticky, all right? You ready? Verse 9. You talk about bridge and context. Let me see if I can help you here. Verse 9, uh, Paul writes this to Titus. He says, uh, teach slaves. Oh, that's fun to talk about in church. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything. To try to please them, not to talk back to them and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted. Now again, let me give you original context. In the early, uh, the first century, by the way, in all of recorded history, there has been slavery. And I think it is disgusting. I think it's a horrible thing. But when people look at America and they say, you know, America was a horrible place because of slavery. Yes, it was a horrible thing. And I am so grateful that we are moving further and further of the events in our country. We're moving through them. But it is a part, an aside, and an effect of fallen man. And it has existed, by the way, it didn't start here in America. It started in other places. It goes as far back as history has been recorded. Um, So, with all that being said, Paul originally is speaking to an audience where it was normal that there was slavery. But he speaks directly to the slaves. And he says this, he says, teach slaves to be subject to their masters and everything, to try to please them and not talk back to them and not to steal from them. Now, let me see if I can bridge a context. Um, how many of y'all have a mortgage? You have a mortgage? You owe, I mean, you don't own your house. The bank does, right? You still get to pay the taxes, but the bank owns your house, right? How many of y'all? Put your hands up really high. Let me get a little bit more. Keep your hands up if you got. How many of you own or are buying a car? You have a car payment, all right? Cool. All right, so let me put this into context. You are a slave to the lender. You owe them. So you like to say, honey, let's go to Taco Bell. But Ford Motor Company wants their money before you eat the tacos, right? I don't know why Taco Bell and Ford fit together, but for some reason it did. They want their money. So let me do something else. Um, And I, I won't ask this because some of you may not be there, but if you have a job, if you have a job, let's apply this, let's bridge the context, let's put it into today's world. If you have a job, you are working for someone, 
Hopefully when you go to work, you don't have to call your boss master, but ultimately you are working for someone. If you are an employee, and some of your uh, people sitting in first service, and I could just see people shake their heads like, well, I'm self-employed. <laughs> I've been self-employed. You know what self-employed means? It means that every single job that you do, you're working for that person. So when you're self-employed, you don't have one boss, you got about 400 million. That's what you got, all right? So every single one of us, here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, teach those who are employed, those who have someone over them, teach them. Teach them to please them, to not talk back to them, and not to steal from them. Same illustration I gave a moment ago in a little bit of a different context. If you're going to leave church today, and man, worship was off the hook, you're going to be going to work tomorrow going, hey, good morning, it's good to see you. Jesus! I'll tell you, you're going to go to work tomorrow. You're going to be so excited. Worship was fantastic. You're excited. If you clock in tomorrow morning and go, man, I'm so excited to be a Christian, and you clock in and say, I am at work, and you spend your first 25 minutes on social media, you are stealing from your boss. If you don't do what your boss asks you to do, you are stealing from your boss. If you are self-employed and you are doing contract work and you are taking advantage of people, you are stealing from your boss. So does that make sense as we apply this? And then Paul says, let me tell you why. Because in every way, they'll make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. Attractive. That's what it means to be a leader. Let, Let me give you this and I'm done, all right? Um, we lead more, we lead more by what we do than what we say. So the way that you live your life, now this is not an excuse to not speak about Jesus, but I can tell you, you speak more about the way you live than by what you say. We know this as parents. It's more about what we do than what we say. It's really hard that when you're upset at your kids because they're angry with each other, when you look down at your kid and you go, stop yelling at your brother! Can somebody just record your voice when you do that? We lead more by what we do than what we say. And then here's the last thing. I'm going to give you some next steps because we all have next steps we need to take. So here's the last thing. I need you to understand this. We're all leading someone somewhere. You are. One of my favorite things we've done this year with our families is we did our summer jam just a few, few weeks ago in July. Um, we had all of uh, Crystal leading our children's ministry, our family, family and children's ministry. She got her kids together. We had a great weekend. Not only that, um, she got together with, with Heath and Rachel, our student pastors, and got them together. And we got our students up here involved. And we had, uh, we had the, the, the solid gold dancers up here. These were our teenage girls that were up here and teaching kids to do the hand motions. Maybe y'all were here that Sunday. It was fantastic. They were dancing. Crystal got up here on Sunday morning and danced with them 14-year-old girls. And my wife was more impressed by that than anything that happened happened that entire weekend. I was like, kick your leg up. Oh, hammy. It wasn't going to work. But anyway, um, this is what was cool. Um, Went to dinner with a couple just a week or so ago. And they have a little girl. And what I kept hearing over and over, sitting at, it was actually lunch, sitting at lunch with them, is that little girl kept saying how much she loved the teenage girl that was up here leading. And I was just sitting there going, get it, Miss Crystal. You got, you got students working up in the children's area. And these five, six, seven, eight-year-old kids, they're watching the generation above them, the teenagers. And those teenagers, hey, adults, we need to give them somebody to watch. We need to give them somebody to follow. We need to move through it. And that was one of my favorite things that happened was watching that. Mm, I love it. That's how you lead. Somebody, somebody is following. So let me give you some next steps, and then I'm done. We're going to start doing this every week, especially through this series. I'm going to give you some next steps. This is not just listening to a good message, having a laugh, applying scripture, getting your toes stepped on. I want you to do something. Here's your next step. Number one, who are you leading, and where are you taking them? you got to identify that. If you're a parent, your answer is pretty doggone obvious because you're going home with them. Don't leave them here, all right? Who are you leading, and where are you taking them? You're taking them to lunch, but you're also taking them somewhere. 
Your ultimate goal is to release followers of Jesus into the society and into the world who proclaim Jesus and are productive people in the world. You're leading them. For the rest of us, um, maybe our kids are grown and we got grandkids or wherever we are, we're leading people. You're leading people somewhere. If you're a teenager here this morning, you're leading somebody in the way you live and the way that you talk and the things that you do. We're all leading someone somewhere. You need to identify that. Who are you leading and where are you taking them? That is the first thing you need to ask yourself. Here's the second thing. What is one thing, one thing you can do this week to be a better leader? What's one thing? You got to identify it. What's one thing? I, I'm going to give you a couple of ideas, okay? Here's one. Um, begin to daily pray with your spouse and your children. If you're married, you can do that. And by the way, we, we talk a lot about married people here, and there's a lot of people here that are single. And, and I know sometimes that gets kind of a bad rap, and you feel like half if you're single. But God created you as a whole person, okay? Ultimately, if God does give you someone to marry one day, that doesn't make you a half a person again. You're a whole person created in Christ, and you get to serve someone else and love someone else once you get married. So even though I'm giving this as an illustration for married couples, this can apply to you as well. Um, begin to pray daily. Um, for those of us that, that have spouses, I'll challenge the men first. Remember, you're going to be held responsible. So it's, it's going to be crazy. If you're married, I know y'all are doing other things. Y'all can pray together, Okay. Pray together. Husbands, take the lead and pray with your wife. Pray with your children. One of my very, I don't know, it's just one of my favorite things in the world that um, I got to see this summer when we got together with my son and my daughter-in-law and my grandson, who's the coolest thing ever in the entire world. Um, this was so awesome. I watched them as they began to, uh, they began to pray with him before meals. Now, don't, listen, he's not even two yet. When, when, when mom and dad say, all right, Ezra, let's pray, all he's waiting for is everybody to close their eyes so he can get food off your plate. That's all he's interested in. But the principles are being taught, and it's there. And then when I would hear them say, we're going to say your prayers before you go to bed tonight. Oh, man, do that. Do that. So you, you want some ideas? Begin to pray. Second one is this one. Find someone, someone, it could be anybody, and I, I would say this. If you're married, um, get somebody other than your spouse that you can have an accountability person with, find someone to ask what they see needs improvement in you. The reason I say to ask somebody other than your spouse is if you ask your spouse what needs to be improved, you're going to get a list, all right? So um, you just step outside of that a little bit and find somebody that can pour into your life, somebody that will speak the truth to you and help you become the person you need to be in Christ, but find someone. And then the last one is this, maybe, maybe this morning um, you need to take your first step and follow Jesus. Um, Jesus gave his life for you. Jesus said, I'm, I'm going to die for you. I'm going to raise again, and I want to live for you. And maybe that's the step you need to take this morning. I'm going to pray, and then when, I, when I'm done, Kyle's going to come out and close this out. Let's pray. Jesus, I love you. Uh, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to begin this series to help us understand that, uh, God, we can be reconciled to you, and also to understand that we're all leaders. Um, God, we can't shirk that responsibility. We can't move it off and hand it to somebody else. We all have a responsibility before you to lead others. And help us to recognize we're all leading someone somewhere. So uh, give us the courage to lead in following you. God, I pray that you help people take their next step. Make a decision to follow you this morning. Make a decision to be the man, the woman that they need to be, to be the student they need to be, the child they need to be. God, we're all leading someone somewhere. Help us take those next steps and to follow you. We love you. It's in your name I pray. Amen.